I'm Quaylin Nassar. What happens to us when we die? I'm sure you've asked yourself that question. It's been popular conversation. People are always talking about it. And there's so many answers to that question, especially in the Orthodox faith. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What happens when you die? We're so lucky to be able and fortunate to be able to have Father Thomas Hopka with us as our guest, who's going to be able to answer those, some of those questions for you. He's a renowned theologian of the Orthodox faith, the former dean of St. Vladimir's Seminary. And in addition to that, he's an author of many Orthodox publications. And John Reggetti is going to be talking with him and asking him that very question that's on our minds. What happens to us when we die? I'm John Reggetti, and our guest today is Father Thomas Hopko. Father, welcome. Nice to be here. What an interesting topic. What a phenomenal topic for us to address, and perhaps one most misunderstood and one really difficult to cover, the concept of death, particularly in the context of Christianity. I once spoke with a priest who said to me, when you sit as I do at the deathbeds of so many people, you can tell how prepared people are for death by the look on their faith, face. Excuse me. And, you know, sometimes how does one even prepare for it? Because we don't know what this thing death is. So let's start talking about, in the context of your knowledge based in the church, what is death? Well, my opinion, honestly, John, is, is that this is one of the most misunderstood aspects of the faith. Because I think we just naturalized Christianity, accepted the immortal soul. And so most people go to church and they want the priest to help them to be healthy, live long, have a good life. After they've seen all the doctors, they call the priest, hoping for a miracle to keep someone alive as long as they can. Then the inevitable moment of death comes, and then all of a sudden, a completely different view comes. Oh, they're in a better place. They're now with God. Their soul has gone off somewhere. Well, I'm here to tell you, that is not the Christian teaching, and it is not the biblical teaching at all. <laughs> How so? How so? In the Bible, in the Old Testament, when you were dead, you were dead. You were rotting in the tomb. Your soul didn't go though anywhere to be any gods. Uh, there was no immortality of the soul. You were dead. So you your stunk. experience on life was in life here on earth was it. That was it. However, it began to develop, develop since there is God. That God is somehow taking care of everything. He's the Lord of life and death. It even says in Scripture, I kill, I make alive. So, so people felt that God was in this. And then they believed, they came to believe, that even though they died, they are in the hands of God. And so there developed in the Old Testament a, a teaching about Hades, Sheol, the bosom of Abraham and all that kind of thing. And very simply, this is too simply put, but for our purposes today, I think it's okay. When you were dead, the teaching came to be. That if you were a righteous person, you were in the hands of God, and you were waiting for the Messiah, the Messianic King, to come and rescue you from the pit in order to take you into the kingdom of God as a just person who kept the commandments. If you were a wicked doer, you were in Abaddon, in the pit, and you were beginning already to be tormented, and you were going to get what was coming to you when the Lord God mighty acted to open up the graves. <laughs> Now, for example, in the gospel, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke's gospel, it's not about life after death. It's about the state of being dead before the Messiah comes. <laughs> you see, before the Messiah comes. Now, our Christian view is that Jesus is the Messiah, and the Messiah comes to die. He's the, Jesus is the only human being who was ever born to die. <laughs> because he had to die to trample down death by his own death. And even on our icon in the Orthodox Church of Pascha of, of the, the resurrection, he's pulling Adam and Eve out of the tomb. The descent into Hades. Yeah, and, and you could see that even for Jesus, death was a horror. I mean, a great book was written once comparing Jesus' death to Socrates' death. Jesus was in the garden praying, weeping, begging, because death, as St. Paul said, was the last enemy, the devil's tool, the wages of sin, the enemy of God. And that's why today, by the way, is the leave-taking of Pascha, uh, the last day of the Easter season before Ascension Day. And that song, the psalm that we sing is, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. It's not about immortality of the soul. 
It's about the fact that we're dead rotten like Lazarus stinking in the tomb unless God saves us. Now, the Christian view is he has saved us, and he has saved us by dying. That's the great Christian claim. Our, our song today is Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. And so our comfort is that Christ is risen. And our faith also is that since he has died, and in symbolic language entered Sheol, the realm of death, to demolish it, death now is no more. So we would say when a person dies now, you run into Jesus. Now, and you've got to face him. And you've got to answer. And that's what happens when you die. Okay. <laughs> when you die, you come face to face with God in, the, in his son Jesus, raised and glorified. And then it ain't a picnic. Or it might be, depending on how you lived your life. Now, once before we were face to face with God at creation, at Adam and Eve. And there are those who would say to you, when God created Adam and Eve, before their sin, would they have died? Was it God's plan for us to all physically die? Yes, it was his providential plan because he knew that it would happen. There is no record in Scripture of an onfall in human life. The very first things that Adam and Eve, the earth creatures, do is sin. And so sometimes we speak a little too glibly about what Adam and Eve were doing in Paris and so on. Well, as a matter of fact, the only thing that we know for sure that they were doing in paradise is rebelling against God, <laughs> sinning. And That's the only that. act we And he, he knew, knew it. That. He knew it. And so death is, is part of the providential plan of God. You know, when I was a young priest in, in Ohio, uh, I had lots of funerals. In fact, I had 11 funerals in the first nine months, and the oldest person was 53, and all the people said Father Tom brought death to this church. Well, to make the story short, uh, once one of the funeral directors who, who took care of our church, he said, Father Tom, I've been a funeral director all my life. My father was one. I grew up in this business. I never heard anyone say what you say at a funeral. Never. Whether it was Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, whatever, uh, ethical culture. And I let it go because I figured, you know, he had the church wrapped up anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, but then when he said it a second time, then when another funeral director said the very same thing, I decided to ask. I said, Steve, what's this about? He said, almost everyone says at death, you got to go sometimes. There's a time to live, a time to die. It's the will of God. Your soul goes to some other place. You're with the Lord. And you never say that, Father Tom. You get up and say, God did not make death. He does not want to die. We die because of our sin. Now, God knew that we would do that, and, and, and death is still in his, in his hands. So it is true providentially how we die, when we die, where we die, that is in God's hands. But that we die is not his will. But then Christ comes and saves us. So then our hope is that Christ has destroyed death, raised the dead, and that's what we comfort ourselves with. Not with some doctrine of immortality of the soul, but the resurrection of our whole life. Our bodies are resurrected. We put on the risen body of Christ. So if somebody says, what happens to you when you die? Well, when you die, you come face to face to Christ, and he's trying to clothe you with his risen body. And to put it very quickly, if you like it, it's paradise. If you don't, it's hell, and that's the judgment. I see. <laughs> and there also is, of course, more nuanced teaching that when we die, we still have a lot of ungodly stuff in us, and it's got to be purged out. And so they developed this teaching of the, well, in the Orthodox tradition, the so-called toll houses, where you've got to be freed from all the demons that hold you. And it has nothing to do with punishment. It has to do with being purified. And, and that's where the prayer of the church comes in. That's where the funeral service. And in it, the Western church, this became what? Well, in the West later, it became a, a doctrine of purgatory, which has a good root, but is unacceptable if it means you got to get punished for your earthly sins before you can go to heaven. That's not our teaching. Our teaching is you got to be purified of your passions before you can enter into the kingdom of God. And the process of dying is that process. So people say, you mean that you could repent after death? And my answer always is, it all depends what you mean by when you're dead. And you're not really dead yet when your body is dead. You're dead when you're in hell. <laughs> That's when you're dead. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, in orthodox, the second death. In orthodox teaching, and one of the things we also talk about is praying for the dead. 
Yeah. This is not a foreign concept for us. And this gets, I think, a little bit more to your issue about when does well, death actually well, this occur. This is very important because we're all in this together. We're a communion of human beings. It's because if anyone anywhere rebelled, it would infect the whole humanity, and that's what we mean by the sin of Adam. But we're a, communon, a communal uh, reality. We are all members of Christ. So we're all in this together. So we pray for each other all the time. The church is this. Now, we believe that since Christ is risen and He is glorified, even death does not break that communion. So the church is a communion, not only of people who are alive now, but people who are biologically already dead. And when someone dies, we've got to cultivate a new relationship with them. That's one of the things a Christian does. As soon as a person dies, you say, okay, our earthly relation is over. Now we have to relate to them in the presence of God. So we pray for them, and we hope that they're forgiven, and we hope that they're purified. And then, of course, if, we, if they're holy people, and if they're canonized saints, and even if they're not, like my mother. I'm sure if my mother's not with God, nobody is. So I say, Ma, help me, be with me. When you serve the liturgy, when you're in church, all those icons, they're all there. The communion of the saints. In fact, the 12th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, it says, um, if Moses was terrified when he went to that mountain, how much more terrified should we be when we go to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the assembly of angels in festal gathering? And then it even says, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So all the departed are with us in church. So death is broken and we can have this relation. So the same way we pray for each other while we're, st we're still here, as long as we're still here, we keep praying. <laughs> you know, we keep praying for the others until the end comes. And of course, it's never too late with God. So when we pray for the dead, what we're doing is establishing a new relationship with them, uh, a yes. different kind and of relationship. What we're doing also, you got to say it, we're changing the whole divine providence because God heard our prayer not only before we said it, but before He even created the world. So if I pray for my departed father, this Saturday will be the 27th anniversary of his death, May 19th, uh, if I pray for him, it's not like God is sitting around wondering, is, is Father Tom going to pray for his dad? God heard my prayer for my dad before my dad, not, not only before he died, but before he was born. Not only before he was born, but before the earth, the world was created. And God's plan, which includes death, the providential plan includes death, also includes our prayers for each other, including our prayers for the dead. Because we're constant, and we believe that the dead are praying for us too. Right? Right? Hold that thought. We're going to come back okay. and talk a lot more about this. Okay. okay. I'm Quaylen Nassar, and I'm going to be talking with Matthew Reed. You heard Father Tom talk about communion and that how we're all together. And, you know, in the Orthodox faith, communion is something that we take in every divine liturgy. You know, when you look at Communion, how do you see, Matthew, um, and you've converted recently to the Orthodox Church in the past several years, but how do you see that communion helps us in, I'm going to say, our future life, but then again, there are some questions that Father Tom even left with that. Sure. Uh, I think um, immediately what comes to mind is the prayers before communion uh, uh, where, and the hymn, actually, also, where we say, we pray and we uh, sing um, like the thief, I confess, they remember me uh, in thy kingdom. Um, and uh, that we hear over and over, we sing it over and over um, uh, during the liturgy as, as we're um, uh, coming forward to communion. And uh, I think that that, that that link there is important, um, that uh, a part of this communion that we're, we're participating in is uh, a preparation for the, the kingdom uh, of God and uh, a hoping for and a, a praying for and a preparing for um, God's kingdom. And, and he also talked about, you know, everyone is with us. I mean, does, do you feel that when you go to take communion that there are those who have gone before you and those who are about to come along sure, with you? Sure, and I think that it's not, it's not just those before and those after. I uh, have a friend right now who's in um, who's in Russia, and um, there's a, a sense that when I'm here in Pittsburgh, um, and my friends in, in Russia, we both uh, attend 
go to the liturgy, who both um, take communion um, the, in, a, in a real way, well, psychologically, because we both the same uh, liturgy of uh, St. John Chrysostom and the same prayers and the same scripture, but also a different language, of course, but uh, uh, also in, in a real way that we are in the same place um, uh, in, in heaven almost. Um, uh, together during the liturgy. Um, and so if it, that's true for me and my friend here on earth, uh, different sides of the world, I think also um, n not just, uh, you know, the time and space, but also uh, our children and um, our ancestors and also right. the, the saints um, and the angels and so forth. Well, when you look at uh, communion and, and has that been a new experience for you, confession and communion, and, and as you've come become an Orthodox? I, I think uh, definitely. Um, oh, one way to put it would be the communion as communion um, ha has been a new um, new experience. Uh, it's not uh, just me going and eating something or drinking something um, and it just being just something that one does, but it, as communion, as part of a community, as part of um, uh, I, it's hard to talk about because uh, it's a very it's, personal, it's, deep your own. But your, in the yeah. same way, um, it's it's part of a community and part of it's something that uh, right. with others too. Let me ask you, Father Tom also talked about you know you you need to be purified um, and mostly as that happens as in relationship to death. Do you feel that communion while you are alive helps to purify you, your soul, um, as you even, everyone is approaching death no matter as we're moving forward, but do you feel that that helps you to, to do that? Yeah, and I, I think that um, we talked about the pre-communion prayers, but also a perfect example would be uh, when we pray after communion. Um, one of the prayers says, um, uh, God, you're consuming fire, consuming the unworthy, consume me not, um, but may my sins flee from me as from fire. Um, and, I, and I think um, that, that that is kind of the way I, I feel sometimes or hope that my sins will flee from me and um, that purification will happen. Well, I think communion is very special for all of us. Thank you, Matthew, for being with us. Thank you. And we're going to go back to John Rigetti and Father Tom talking about what happens when you die. And I would bet this next segment is going to just say lots of stuff. Why is Easter celebrated on a different Sunday each year? Jesus Christ's passion and resurrection occurred during the Jewish Passover. Therefore, Christians follow the Jewish calendar and celebrate Easter on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. The Orthodox also take seriously the ancient rule that the Christian Passover must follow the Jewish feast and not precede it. So in some years, it may fall much later than in others. Welcome back. Our guest is Father Thomas Hopko, and we're talking about death. Perhaps one of the most intriguing topics we've ever covered on this show. And I have to tell you, Father, my head is swimming, and I suspect many of our viewers are kind of stunned in terms of the material that we've covered in the previous segment. Um, you've kind of taken our, what many people perceive as the traditional Christian interpretation of death and kind of turned it on its head. So let me start kind of, I guess, where we should start, and that's when I die... If my soul separates from my body, where does my soul go? Okay. First of all, I'm glad that there's some confusion because I think that there's so much false clarity. I used to tell my students, better real confusion than false clarity. I always also, I think we sh must remember that our, we learn everything from Christ in the Bible, in the Gospels. We don't come with our idea of immortal souls going to heaven and so on. We have to read the scripture. In the scripture, first of all, a human being is a incarnate uh, life. We're a living being with flesh and blood. 
so we could say that soul, or in Hebrew, nefesh, it means life. That's what it means. And sometimes even in the New Testament now, they translate that word, not soul, but life. In Hebrew, there's not even a word for body. You have a word flesh. So we are vivified flesh, bodies, or we are incarnate spirits or souls. And even the word spirit, animals have souls, plants have souls. It just means they're living. The human soul is spiritual. It's self-conscious. It's free. It's godlike. So we are this total, how can you, if you use fancy language, pnevmatopsychosomatic being, we are spiritual soul body being. So soul and body are not they're, they can't be they separated. Not, they are inseparable. As my teacher, Father Florosky, used to say, we're not a combination of a ghost and a corpse. Now, for Plato, the body was a prison. Soma sima, he said in Greek. And, and they, they were happy when the soul went away. They thought the soul went away to be with the gods and the world. That's not a Christian view. In the Christian view, when your soul and body, to use those terms, are rented apart, you're dead. That's what death is. So that's the definition of Even death. Even the definition of death is the separation of soul and body. And that's a bad thing. That's not a good thing. So the soul going from the body is not a good thing. We're dead. Now, in the scripture, I believe, if you read it, there isn't an idea of immortal soul. There's the idea that our life is in the hands of God. So we would say everything is in the hands of God. Now, God created us to live and not die. St. Paul called death the last enemy to be destroyed. And we have to be reunited with our body. The followers of Plato didn't like that. Plotinus said, I never heard of anything more disgusting. Who wants this crummy body? For us, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The flesh is good. You know, the, the Holy Fathers, like Gregory Palamas said, our nature is superior to angels because we have bodies, because we are bodies. And, 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 the, and the, head of the, the, the head in creation is the human being, not the angel. So human beings have to, have to have this fullness of the cosmic reality, spirit, soul, body, mind, passion, feeling. We, we're like rocks, we're like plants, we're like animals, we're like angels. We're like, we, we have all of these reality. When we sin and rebel against God, that falls apart. And that's what death is. Now, as I, as I tried to say earlier, in the Old Covenant, at first, like in the early parts of the Bible, that was just how you were. Abraham died, went to his parents, he was in his kids. And the worst thing that could, could happen to you in the Bible would be that you'd die young, or you'd die at the hands of disease, or you'd die at the hands of enemies. But if you lived in an old age and had a pretty good life, it was considered okay. But still, there was this problem of death. And where it comes from, and the wisdom of Solomon in Scripture says, God did not create death. We bought death through listening to the demons, and, and therefore our bodies are, and souls are rent apart, and we die. And that's bad. We should weep. Jesus wept over death. He wept over Lazarus, knowing that he would raise him. However, Lazarus wasn't really risen from the dead. Lazarus was biologically resuscitated for more life in this world. He still had to die. Sure. Yeah. Now, only Jesus is raised never to die again because he's raised into the glory of God, being the Son of God, who took on death to destroy it. So what we believe is now, until the Lord comes in glory, when we die, we encounter Christ raised and glorified. And that's a kind of a judgment. And, 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 and what's ever evil in us if we cling to it, it'll send us to hell. If we let it go and, and repent of it, and, and we believe we can help each other by our prayers in doing that, then we can make it into the fullness of life in the kingdom of God. Now, we believe, it's, I, I believe anyway, I put it that way, it's much better not to say, where are the dead people now? It's better to say, when you die now and leave the conditions of the planet Earth and the life as we know it, what happens to you totally? And here I think that the answer would be, you enter into the presence of the risen Christ and you begin already entering into the age to come. And I honestly believe that in church, we are still in this world. But those who die, we pray for them as if the end had already happened to them. And so, so we pray for the forgiveness of their sins and we pray that, and if they're saints, we pray for them to pray for us that they're alive in God and we're all members of one another. We're in communion with each other. So it's better to say, we don't know what's going on except what we do know 
is that since Christ has risen from the dead, death has been transformed. It's, it's the tool of the devil has become the way of witnessing to Christ. That's why the martyrs are the real Christians, because they can transform death. We sing in our church on Easter, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. We all have to trample down death by faith and grace in Jesus, but we do it by dying. And the proof of the pudding is how do we die? And that, now, if we die daily, we don't have to worry. <laughs> and that death ends yeah. in the reunion of body and soul in yes. the second coming exactly. of Christ. Exactly. Right. Yeah, but my opinion is also that that second coming for the dead has already happened. For us, it hasn't happened yet because we haven't died yet. But I think that there's an immediacy that happens that you're clothed with the risen Christ and you already, and that's how we think of the saints, as already glorified in the kingdom of God because Christ is already glorified. The Theotokos is already glorified. So that's what we hope for. And so we believe that when we die, we enter into the kingdom of God. You know, Father, if we're saved, <laughs> absolutely fascinating. Right. But, you know, it begs another question. We're going to have to have you back for another show. And that's going to be what about heaven and hell? Right. So I hope you'll come back and join us and we can well, talk I'll more about that. Do it because that will help us to clarify this creative confusion that we've raised today. <laughs> Great. Thanks right. for being here again. Okay. Right. Oh, my goodness. I don't know about you. But you're right, there's confusion and maybe some clarity, and certainly this topic has to be talked about a lot more in the future. And we plan to do that on Orthodoxy Now on television, and if you'd like to hear more about the Orthodox faith, you certainly can as you listen to WEDO, which is 810 on your AM dial um, on Wednesday mornings at 930. And of course, you'll like a lot more of these wonderfully hot topics that we have for you uh, on Orthodoxy Now on television, on Christian Associates Channel 95, and on Comcast On Demand. Write to our website if you'd like to uh, let us know about a topic you'd like to hear about. And we promise you to bring more programs just like this one that are so intriguing that maybe you don't get all of the answers in one show. I'm Quaylen Nassar. Thanks for joining us.